Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome this afternoon to CQC's uh, launch of our Smiling Matters Oral Health in Care Homes Progress Report. Uh, my name is Alison Chilton. I'm the Deputy Director of Operations and I'm delighted to be here today to uh, chair this webinar for you all. I'm joined today by uh, Mary, John and Manny from CQC. Uh, we'll hear from uh, the webinar team later on, so I'm sure they'll introduce themselves. And we've got Claudia and Donald Day from um, a care home provider from Bupa, and we're delighted that they've attended us. And then in the background supporting with the webinar, we've got Charlie, Sarah, Jen, Lizzie and Steph. So I just wanted to start by um, touching on what we found with our last Smiling Matters uh, report. So that was published in June 2019. And some of those findings were that people living in care homes were not always supported to maintain and improve their oral health. So we found that people didn't always have the access that they should have had to their routine dental care and the amount of detail that we saw in care plans that really did vary between uh, care homes. So some care, care homes had a lot, others didn't. And um, at that time we outlined six recommendations and that was across the health and social care landscape. So we recently visited, when I say recently, last year in 2022, we went back out and did some uh, further work to see how we'd got on in comparison to the last uh, report that we did. So if I can have the next slide, please, Steph. Thank you. So what did we find three years on? So care homes now are much more aware of the NICE oral health guideline. Um, 66, uh, sorry, 61 percent uh, of people in 2019 were aware of this guidance, but this has now increased to 91. So that's a really good improvement um, in getting that that um, information out there and people more aware of it, uh, providers in care homes more aware of it. Um, we have more than doubled the proportion of care plans uh, fully covered uh, oral health needs. So in the different reviews between 2019 and 2022, um, you can see there from the figures that we, we've gone from 27% um, in 2019 to 60% to, to in 2022. But there's still more work to be done as, you know, as we often find, even though things have improved, you know, it's um, it, it's good to always be looking to improve and, and to ensure that more care plans are covering oral health. So the percentage of care homes providers saying that staff always or mostly received specific training has also doubled. And again, that's that's a great improvement. And we were really pleased to see some of those um, those moves forward. But it does mean, as we've pointed out there on the slide, that 40 percent of staff uh, may not receive training and, and that still needs to improve. The next slide, please, Steph. Thank you. So the areas to improve, um, our inspection teams went out and we did a we did a sample of inspections across the country, um, across all regions, and there were still variances in um the uh care homes missing, people living in care homes missing out on vital care from dental practitioners. And, you know, that was linked to it being at the right time, but also in the right place. And care home providers also highlighted to us that there just wasn't enough dentists able or willing to visit into the care homes to treat people, um, particularly those who are less mobile and, and not able to go out either uh, with support or with families or, or care workers to, to go and visit a dentist. These just give you a flavour of the different percentages of, of what we found. So when we asked, um, when we looked at the review of care plans and how well do care plans cover oral health needs, you can see the difference there in the three different um, three different statements. So in 2022, we found that 60 percent fully covered people's oral health. That was 27 back in 2019 when we did the, our, our first Smiling Matters review. Um, so it's great that it's improved. But again, there's still a there's still quite a chunk of um, care plans there where we, we haven't got it fully covering what people's oral health needs are. And then you can see the same for uh, where it partially covers oral health. Um, we actually where it partially covers oral health is, has, has kind of changed it and gone down, uh, which, you know, it's increased in, in full. So, you know, that, that's an improvement, but, um, you know, it, it, it's reduced from what it was. And so where they didn't have any care plans, not at all. Again, there are there are percentage percentages there for that. So where, where we've still got work to do, so information about residents eligibility for free or subsidised NHS dental care included in the care records. Again, there's increases there, um, but 
uh, on the bottom, you know, where we're answering the question, where the answer to that question is no. Um, again, that's reduced, which is good. Um, and where it's increased, uh, it's more than doubled. So again, you know, there's still work to do because that figure is still only 39 percent. So um, there's there's still a, a chunk there to do. So in answer to the question, do staff receive specific training in oral health care? Um, Yes, always or mostly always um, is 60%. Uh, it was 30%, so again, that's doubled. But again, that still means, as I said in an earlier slide, there are 40% of staff who um, are, are not definitely getting that training. And, and it's variable when it, it's sometimes, and there's still a chunk of, of staff who aren't getting uh, specific training in oral health care. And if we you know, if we're going to make a difference and we want to make a difference in care homes, then obviously we've got to make sure the staff have all the training that they need. So access to NHS care was still a problem. So um, when we asked the question about can residents access NHS dental care routinely, um, it, you know, in fact, that was that was less than what it was before. So um, in 2022, it was 35% and it, and it was 67% uh, previously. And you know, in that sometimes 40% of people said sometimes um, and 25% of people said no, they can never access it. So there's definitely a problem with access um, to, to that routine care, as I said in a, a previous slide. So this is just a sample here on this slide of what providers told us uh, about some of the difficulties that they're having in accessing um, oral health support for um, people in their care. So, you know, if I just pull pull one of those out, oral health care is very interesting. Good oral health is a good way to maintain the whole health and oral health needs to be supported first. So um, a provider just sharing that when they um, are supporting people, they would look in their mouths for uh, bleeding wounds and the colour of the tongue, any loose teeth. Um, and obviously there's there's a knock on effect if someone's oral health is poor, you know, in terms of whether they'll eat and and, and their weight and, and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's about proactively trying to, to get that right for people. So you see some of the comments there. So this is a list of recommendations So the report that we've um, just produced. Uh, it was published on Monday. So um, that's the from the reviews that we've done in 2022. Um, we've come up with a list of 11 recommendations. Um, you can obviously see them on these slides, but just to, to pick out a few of them. So um, one of the recommendations is to commission a specific oral health survey in care homes uh, where we can include um, also a cohort of residents in an oral health survey surveys as well to get that that um, resident voice through in uh, the surveys that are, are, are done to to see what their views are. Um, we have recommended that the oral health, um, the topic of oral health should be reinstated into training for the care certificate. Um, that's not fully embedded in that. Um, so, so, you know, that would be a recommendation from the, from the findings we've got. Um, that there's clear guidance for care providers um, when residents refuse or resist oral care, that we update guidance for dental professionals providing domiciliary care. Um, as we all know, a lot of people are um, staying in their own homes and that's something we would actively promote in the care sector. Um, but in order for that to be successful for their oral health, you know, it would be um, it would be good to have that updated guidance for, for domiciliary care. And then promoting cross sector integration between care home and dental professional. Again, that supports that system working and that outcome for people um, and the, uh, the the good pathways of care, of care for people and the access to care. And then the last uh, few recommendations here that I've not already touched on there. So using funding to improve oral health and care homes through local initiatives like peer to peer support schemes or increasing dental access and training. Um, We've suggested that the government consider automatic exemption from NHS dental charges when people move into a care home um, and, you know, hopefully that would make a difference and, and take down some of the barriers that there is in accessing um, dental dental care as well. Um, and CQC monitoring of ICS is that's in line with our new um, powers that we are um, that are coming into force with the Commission um, should include oral health as part of the assurance that health inequalities are being addressed. And there's a couple of other ones there that I haven't uh, read out that you can see as well. So I hope that gives you a really good flavour of um, the kind of things we find and, you know, I would encourage everyone to go and uh, have a look at the report and absorb that. And um, I hope you find it a really interesting read and, and a useful document um, for driving some of that improvement. So um, 
I would like to come over to the panel members now. So I can just uh, come to John first, just to ask John for his reflections um, in line with the report and the review that we've done and, and the work that's been undertaken, please. So just by way of introduction, my name's John Milne and I'm uh, the National Clinical Advisor for CQC um, for dentistry and oral health. So by profession, I'm a dentist and you can tell by looking at me that I'm not a young dentist. I've been kicking around for a long time, both in the politics of dentistry as well as within, as within High Street General Dental Practice, where I've been a practitioner for 40 years. And so I've had experience of domiciliary care and also delivering care in care homes at various times in my career. This has been an issue, the oral health in care homes, for a long time. And I've been really proud to see the work um, that CQC has done in shining a light on this area of care. I've been really pleased to see the response that this follow up gives us um, from the care home sector. It's great to see the improvements that have uh, taken place in terms of awareness, in terms of training for staff. There's some really good resources out, out there. Public Health England's Oral Health Toolkit is a fantastic resource. And it's, it's lovely to see, and I hope that this continues, and I'm pleased that CQC is going to keep an eye on it going forward. Um, clearly, there are some questions about access. Um, and fixing access to dental care is not something the CQC can do, um, but we've been pointing it out in our state of care and I'm sure there's much more work to be done to raise. Um, let's just say raise the profile of oral health care. I think I've probably said enough now. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, so if I can just ask Manny to come on and um, give his reflections and views, please, that would be that would be great. Thanks. Um, Mani Hussain, I'm Director of Primary and Community Care here at the CQC. So um, oral health, um, being part of primary care, sits under my portfolio. Um, I've, I've in, in previous in a previous career, um, I have worked quite closely with care homes, more on the medicine side, um, as I'm not a, a dentist. But um, one thing that I'm very much passionate about is making sure that people, wherever people are, um, in whichever sector, whether they're in their own home, whether in care homes or what have you, get access to um, the right treatment at, at the right time by the right person. And my, my kind of reflections, um, just following on from what John's saying, you know, we, 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 we did mention um, dental access as, as long as uh, as well as GP access in, in our state of care. Uh, so access is something which I'm, I'm, I'm particularly um, uh, passionate about and, and making sure people. So it it, it kind of upset me when, when I, I when I heard stories where you've got um, residents in, in, in care homes who needed um, um, dental care mm -hmm. and for whatever reason um, weren't able to get it. And we at the CQC really need to use our influence to um, ensure um, commissioners, integrated care boards and ICS's integrated care systems really work together and put the patient at the centre of care and oral health is so important and um, so that's one of the things but the report also gave me quite a bit of hope as well. Um, there were some really good examples where um, pilots have been set up and you know people have joined together and through collaboration and through some innovative funding have really um, done some really wonderful things. So those are my initial kind of reflections of the report. We're, we've still got a lot to do, but um, there certainly is light at the end of the tunnel, especially if you collaborate and work as part of an integrated care system. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Um, and if I can ask uh, Mary, who um, I'm sure Mary will introduce herself, um, if I can ask Mary to come on and give her reflections, that would be great. Thank you. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mary Cridge and I'm the Director of Adult Social Care here at CQC. And I got terribly excited about the first Smiling Matters report. So it's a bit of a thrill, really, to see that we've been back and followed up 
and to see the progress and to think that we have had the terrible pandemic in between the two reports and yet we're still seeing progress is a testament to the absolute care and dedication of people working in uh, residential care. Um, and it brought home to me what a difference it makes to pay attention to what, for those of us in our everyday lives, are the basics. You know, doesn't it feel rotten until you've cleaned your teeth of a morning? Um, so to be um, reliant on the support and encouragement of others to um, take what for the most of us is the, our basic routine of a day that makes a difference to our own health and understanding the connection between oral health and the social interaction that people feel comfortable um, having, um, enjoying food, being able to drink as much as, as is needed, as well as sorting out the pain when it comes um, it, it, in our mouths. Uh, so the report brings home with the examples just what a difference um, that people working in care can make to individuals and not just their well-being but their general quality of life through this. Um, I've heard our chief exec here, Ian Trenholm, talk about, you know, if we can just establish when we're in a care home, is everybody's toothbrush damp, you know, as a sort of insight um, into how things are there. And it's been pleasing to see the guidance that's available. And uh, I remember the original report, the Bay Tree House example, where the manager had been at a local uh, trade association meeting, had heard about the nice guidance, gone back, asked all her team to read it. It was discussed together in a team meeting and it came out in that discussion whose who's oral health folk were worried about. And they just went from strength to strength and examples in the latest report show that too. So I suppose my takeaway is, goodness me, what a difference those of you providing care, providing services can make to people and what a significant difference in, in health that makes. Yes, there are challenges. This report brings those out. But uh, given, given the years in between and the pandemic that hit us all, uh, it's great to see that progress, for which I thank you. So I hand back to you, Ali. Thank you, Mary. And thanks, John and Manny as well. It's always it's nice to have our our reflections and, and you know, recognise that that um, the the um, really hard work that's gone in and, and that goes on every day from people in the health and social care sector. So, um, you know, it's just just to thank people for that as well. Um, if I can come to um, Claudia and Donald, uh, Claudia and Donald are representing a provider here. Um, today and I'm really delighted that they, they've come on to the webinar because I think one of the really important things is to get that provider voice um, and uh, Claudia was in charge um, in a care home when we did one of the inspections as part of this Smiling Matters review in 2022 so uh, last year when we, we did that last summer um, and we'd just like to invite Claudia to give some of her reflections on, um, you know, oral health care in, in her in care home and in, in, in their organisation um, and, and how they uh, approach that and provide um, good support with oral health, uh, oral health care because you had, you know, your really good findings. You know, we found some really positive stuff um, and it would be great if you could just share some of that with with the people on the webinar. Thank you. Okay, yeah, hello everyone. My name is Claudia Carvel and I'm a manager for Bupa Care Services. Um, I think one of the things that I'd like to say about Bupa is that oral health is something that the company are passionate about. It's as important to know the resident's dentist as it is to know their GP, because actually oral health will impact on a resident's well-being um, from top to bottom. So um, we also have internal inspectors who will pick up any areas that they can see within our homes in oral health and other areas that could potentially be improved upon because, you know, all of us learn and improve all the time. Um, we have specific oral health care plans within Bupa. 
So we will have the residents named dentist. We will know whether that's a private dentist or whether that's an NHS dentist. We will know whether the resident is entitled to any kind of specific special dental care from NHS providers. We know right down to how many times a day the resident likes to brush their teeth, what oral products they use, is there anything specific. There's an awful lot in our care plans around oral health, not just what to look out for for, uh, for tongues and, and maybe um, bleeding teeth, but also for gums and any kind of problems that you would have around oral health. And I think because we prioritise this, it's it. I have certainly seen that this has made a huge you know, improvement in the service and the general welfare of our residents. Now, we obviously need a lot of things to to back this up. Um, one of the things certainly at my care home is that we have oral care champions. Um, these champions aren't necessarily nurses. Um, in fact, quite often it's a really good idea to have members of the care team that are oral health champions. So they will be responsible for checking the residents oral health care plan for speaking with new residents who come into our services for checking with our residents on a day to day basis that things are going exactly um, as they'd like them to with their dental care. Um, we also have, um, and I know it's easy to say that Bupa have a dental arm, so this is all very easy for us, but actually we reach out to lots of NHS dentists. We'll speak to families to find out who the residents normal dentist would be and we ensure that that contact is is kept up. Um, we do a training called um, Mouth Matters which we would make sure that every member of staff attends and we will also send our champions out to specific oral health care which they then bring back to the home and cascade that down to the whole team and they're then responsible for monitoring oral health standards around the home. One of the other things that we do is um, certainly at my home um, we have a small shop. Um, a lot of people like with you know other kind of health products have specific dental products that they like. So we do have a wide selection of dental products that residents can browse and buy, that relatives can buy. And we do make sure that if, if there's something specific that a resident likes to use, then that indeed is, is in the home for them, because again, that can make a huge difference. Um, the dentists that we've had um, links with have been really, really good and have provided a lot of training within the home for, for our staff, which has been fantastic. And, and I suppose for me, the last thing really is that oral care is from when your teeth arrive till when you draw your last breath. And for people at end of life, it's very, very important that oral care is continued. Um, so we do quite a lot of work with the local hospices and again with dental teams around oral hygiene at end of life. This will also be in end of life care plans and oral hygiene care plans, even down to the fact that um, pineapple juice will help to break down bacteria. So it would be very, very carefully documented exactly what kind of products we're using to help keep a resident's mouth fresh and clean at end of life because potentially that is going to make them feel more comfortable, make them feel more relaxed and if the relative sitting next to them, if the last thing that they remember is a dirty mouth, then it, it's not actually a memory that we at Booper want them to take forward. So uh, yeah, that's something else that we look very closely at. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's my reflection. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claudia. That's that's really um really interesting and really helpful. I'm sure some people will be able to take away some of those little uh, point it will take away pointers from from what you do and hopefully put that um you know have consideration of that in in their care settings as well. So um thank you very much to everyone on the panel for your reflections. Um. I 
think I'm right in saying that we're moving on to a, a period of questions now. Um, Steph, I think that's correct, isn't it? So um, we've behind the scenes, we've been looking at any questions and, and themes that have been sent in um, or, or put in the chat. So um, the first question that we've got that's come through is around uh, is around um, discharge from hospital. So somebody has said, as a nurse, it's very common for people to be admitted with terrible oral care for dentures and for their own teeth. And how can hospitals help with recognising this on discharge plans? So I'm not sure who would be best placed to answer this, whether it would probably be John or, or Manny, um, potentially. I'm not sure. Well, I'll dive in. I'll dive in. You dive in. <laughs> and then uh, if Thank Manny you. wants to add something, that would be great. Um, and I think I think the first thing I'd say to hospital colleagues who are listening to this is there's been some tremendous work done by a consultant in dental public health called Millie Doshi, and she um, she wrote up up her study called Mouth Care Matters, and there's a whole pile of resources around Mouth Care Matters that I know have been available to hospitals and hospital nursing teams um, that actually help help their staff uh, work around improving the oral health of those who, who are uh, in stay patients or in patients in hospital and and if if that type of work is taken taken up it actually improves things for, for patients on discharge so i'd point to those resources as a first start i've, I've been I've, I've also been flicking through the questions and um the questions around access are just enormously uh, depressing. Perhaps we'll come on to that in a moment. Manny, is there anything you wanted to add to that to that question about the discharge and, and admission? Not really, but I was going to say Mary might have something um, considering uh, some of her background. Of course, yeah. Thank you. So uh, nothing makes me madder than the loss of dentures and glasses in hospitals. And um, I, I know that there are many NHS trusts who've done a lot of good work to try and address this because two ways to mess with your quality of life is, is to lose those two things. Um, so I do think it's an important part, obviously, of a, a person's progression, um, whether they're going into intermediate care for assessment or coming into residential care or being cared for at home, for that careful handover of all those elements of that person's care. And I would expect that um, to be discussed and for pro where there are problems for those to be flagged. We're increasingly interested in, in our new way of working, we'll be able to look at somebody's journey from different parts of the system. So I'm not saying that we, we will pick up every time that happens to an individual, but I really I would encourage care services to flag that to their local trust where that's happening, because that's huge impact on somebody's quality of life and starts, doesn't it? Their, their time in wherever they've gone now to live with a problem to be addressed instead of it being carefully supported to make that transition well. So I, I feel the pain and let's keep raising it because we need to get that sorted. Thank you. I could just come back with another comment here because I, I was at an event towards the back end of last year and I heard the germ of an idea come from coming from a trainee specialist in special special care dentistry with the elderly. And he was trialing a process whereby um, a device called an intraoral scanner was used to actually take a 3D picture, 3D image of a patient or a resident's dentures where they come with dentures. Um, and that could then mean that if a pair were lost, that a duplicate could be easily made and it wasn't desperately expensive. So it might be worth looking out for that research if it, if it gets published. Um, and it's a it, it's a thoughtful solution for the for the issue of lost dentures. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, so I'll move on to the next question that we've got, which is around what assistance can CQC provide to encourage dentists to visit care homes as residents very often cannot access the dental surgery? And that links to uh, what I was saying in the slide and also the recommendations that we've made around um, uh, around that. So um, 
Mammy, I think I'd probably come to you with this one, if that's OK, um, given your role and and uh, and if you can give your your view on that, please. There's, I mean, the report clearly highlights um, there's commissioning involved, funding involved um, and resources as well uh, and capacity of dentists. So there isn't um, a, a simple solution, albeit there are pilots which really you know, through innovative, flexible commissioning have, have, have done uh, some great things. From a CQC perspective, I mean, access, um, general access um, is very, very important. And um, it's particularly important when you've got uh, residents who may be bed bound and what have you, uh, and, you know, access through domiciliary visits. Um, so from a CQC perspective, we we work and through our state of care highlight these issues to commissioners like NHS England. Um, of course, we 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 uh, we 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 speak to um, representatives, uh, representative organisations of dentists, uh, and what have you. But as a as a regulator, our focus will be always on the patient and the care that the patient is receiving, and it's safe, effective and responsive and what have you. So through our state of care, we, we, we use our independent voice to highlight the challenges that patients are facing, um, which have grown um, uh, during the pandemic, and we do that at national level. I guess going forward, um, the, the, the focus is very much so on um, integrated care working you know, integrated care systems, integrated care boards. And CQC has a role to play uh, along with NHS England uh, regarding the assessment of what services are commissioned or in, in our case, the quality of services that are being uh, provided. Um, so we could actually influence uh, at system level. And, you know, I, I'd be very much keen to influence um, integrated care boards and integrated care systems to actually look at uh, issues like uh, poor access uh, and actually come up with solutions which actually uh, can be delivered by, by by that system. So as a regulator, we obviously I'm stating the obvious here. We, we don't get we don't get involved in commissioning decisions, but as a as a as a regulator and an independent, we use our independent voice to to share these challenges. Um, so one of the things I would expect as part of our kind of ongoing uh, when, when we do start uh, assessing systems and what have you is to look at issues around uh, dental access and other access such as GP access and actually ask questions of systems and look at what they're doing to actually um, um, resolve the issues. Ultimately, it's the systems which make the commissioning decisions. And um, I, I, I hope and I, I believe in this that a CQC focus on oral health uh, should encourage systems to take a look at what they're actually doing in this sector. Thank you. Thanks, Manny. OK, so um, just following on from that, because it, it's similarly in linked uh, about access to dentists. Do we, John, I don't know whether you would be the best person probably to answer this. Do you know out in the in the sector and in the dentist dentist sector um, whether there's any work ongoing about um, getting more dentists in terms of a lack of dentists within that? within that field anyway, so the recruitment of more dentists to be able to to address some of these access problems. Well, there are recruitment dentists, sorry, recruitment difficulties for dentists right across the whole of the UK. Um, but in terms of in terms of this environment, um, the original Smiling Matters report did did bring into focus the fact that many dentists are not confident about treating this group of uh, group group of people. Um, sometimes they're wondering what should should they do. Many many people who are resident in care homes now have had kept most of their own teeth, which is a great thing, and it's a tribute to modern dentistry. Um, but but as oral health can sometimes decline. Dentists are unsure what the right thing to do is. You can't do shed loads of treatment on frail elderly people. And so 
I was hoping that the Faculty of Dental Surgery, one of the Royal Colleges, um, would publish some guidance for dentists to help them in this area. I know there is something in the pipeline, but unfortunately it's not yet published, but it will be there soon. And also the resources that have been produced by what was Public Health England, Health Education England, I know are good resources for the dental team. Um, I think dentists across the country can see that this issue is a tricky one. Um, the resources necessary to fix it are mostly time and also also funding. And as Manny said, those those are commissioning issues. And um, and I think we from CQC can can raise the fact that they are commis commissioning issues, but it takes it, it takes some uh, a willingness from the health sector to make the resources available at a time when resources are uh, are incredibly challenging in all all areas of healthcare. So I think I would say that the the uh, the profession is willing, uh, but need to be given the tools to do the job. Um, bear in mind though that the biggest improvement in oral health comes about from keeping the teeth clean, keeping dentures clean, and those are things that we can help people with, both with our, our, our staff working in care homes and also the dental profession can itself um, offer some assistance with training. There's been, a, I noticed one of the questions was asking about this. Um, I'm just aware of one of the dental charities, one called Bridge to Aid, has been um, helping train um, care home staff in the Bristol area. It's, it's just started they've, and um, they've done a bit of a pilot. I understand it's gone really well. And that's the type of thing that I would certainly want to encourage the dental profession to be doing. Thank you, John. Sorry, I couldn't get to my microphone. Um, there's a couple of there's a couple of questions as well that I've just noticed around um, how we support people with, um, for example, dementia, um, with their oral health care, um, people with learning uh, disabilities or difficulties um, and autistic people. And so I'm not sure, uh, John, again, sorry, because I feel like I'm coming to you again, uh, whether you know some of the detail um, with your background and, and your work around what the best practice is around that for dentists and, and for how a care home would would go about getting that support in and and what they should maybe do on their side first before before going to a dentist well i certainly think um getting access to some of the training resources that i've already mentioned the oral health toolkit is is, is very good there is um, a publication i think it was from the faculty of general dental practice called dementia friendly dentistry which is um, again some assistance for the for, for the dental team uh, i noticed one of the questions that came up in the chat was somebody was saying my dentist has, has told us to explore the mouth to help with cleaning using a gloved finger is that okay and the an and the answer to that is yeah absolutely it's okay um and, and I think sometimes for, for people struggling with oral health, particularly in, in the dementia arena, um, we're a bit anxious of doing the wrong thing and I completely understand that that anxiety. Um, but sometimes you, I would say, yeah, don't be afraid to put the glove finger in and, uh, and and going in the side of the cheek helps you to get access with the toothbrush. It means you can do something. Um, but we do need we do need, I think, much more confidence that comes from training and practice. So there's still much more to do. OK, so do we have um, anything that you can share, John, as well, just around community? Um, care so not just in care homes but community care and I know somebody's asked a question around um, not just dental support within care homes but actually for people within the community um, and I know we we made a recommendation about better guidance on that but um, I'm hopeful you might be able to give just a flavour John of of what that community support should look like if it was best practice. Well, the community dental services I know are quite um, quite overstretched throughout the whole of the country, and the community dental services 
do bo both train and employ specialists um, in, in delivering care to vulnerable groups, disadvantaged groups, and also people, people where behavioural issues can make delivering care quite tricky. Um, for, for the wider population, there's stuff going on in schools such as toothbrushing programmes and the like, which aim to encourage children to have better oral health throughout their lives. Um, but in, in, in terms of community support in this arena, um, it's, it's more of a specialist issue. And then part of that is again in bringing the training into the care homes for care home staff. Remembering that the improved oral hygiene is the biggest gain of health that comes out. It reduces the number of bacteria in the mouth. It reduces the risks of aspirational pneumonia and uh, and, and things like that. So those are simple. Those are simple things. Simple to say, not always so easy to do, but the biggest impact is going to be from training our staff. And I see the comments that come in in the um, in the in this. Smiling Matters update, people have been talking about the difficulty in getting oral health champions um, because of the mobility of staff within the care home sector. All of those things are issues, but I wouldn't want to discourage people because I'm encouraged at the improvement that I've seen that this report is showing. So I'd say crack on, you're doing a good job. Let's have a bit more, please. And government, please listen and do something about the resourcing. Thanks, John. Um, it's just one there's one question as well just around um the maintaining good oral health for patients who are approaching end of life and i know that um claudia very uh kindly shared with us some of the examples of what um practice uh, they followed within their care home but again is there some guidance that we can point people to or some um direction we can give people john around um ensuring that they can maintain uh, good oral health at that very important time uh, towards the end of someone's life. I think the issues that I'd really be looking at there are comfort and dignity. Um, in, in, in another role, I'm um, I'm on the board of a of a hospice in New Yorkshire, and uh, I know some of our hospice staff where people are there for a short stay um, they they have been they've been looking at how they can ensure that the oral health is comfortable comfort and dignity i think is recognizing when there are things that cause pain um, recognizing when pain is is present that comes from oral origin particularly if it's affecting eating and things like that so at end of life i would say keep it simple you John and I think a lot a lot of the questions there's a lot of questions about access to um NHS dentists so not so much dentists coming into the home but actually just even getting registered with an NHS dentist is a real difficulty at the moment um and I'm not sure whether there's um any information we can share around nationally what might be being looked at to you know in in terms of that or whether there's any uh government work uh, ongoing around that because obviously as people are raising in the uh, questions you know it's quite it, it's very expensive if people are having to access um you know private dental care and and especially you know older people in care homes may not be in that position to be able to to pay for that and and therefore the, the oral health suffers so i'm not sure if there's anything that we can we can talk around that john uh, or manny even if you know of, of anything um probably john i feel <laughs> Sorry, John, I feel I'm like everything's been, defaulting. Uh, it's OK, it's why I'm here and it's absolutely uh, fine. Don't feel you. bad about that. <laughs> the, the, the thing that struck me and I've, I've read loads and loads of the questions in the chat and they're great questions. It's just that it's a problem for the general public to get access to NHS dental care. Um, it's a problem even for some to get access to private care. And and so the level of despair creeping through the questions is it, it, it's difficult to read and it's difficult to read because the answers seem to be intractable they need reform of the nhs contracting system commissioners 
need to be imaginative in making sure that the care homes can have access to dentists who can come and see patients or for care homes to be able to get their residents to the dentist themselves. And, 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 and this is not in the report and uh, I'm just going off piste very slightly, but in in my dreams, I think that every new care home that's perhaps got more than, I don't know, 15, 20 beds could have a room equipped with a dental chair and the gear that's necessary to to um, enable dentists to to treat dental problems. It's a it's a simple planning issue that I've no doubt would cost a lot of money, but costs about 30, 35,000 pounds to equip a room with the gear for dentistry. Chair can be used for podiatry and things like that. We need to start using our imagination a bit more, but the intractable challenge uh, is one of commissioning NHS dentistry for the whole population. It needs it needs action, as I say, from those who've got the money to do it. Manny. Thanks, John. Um, it goes without saying, um, all of us in this in this meeting are worried about access and and the only, th only message that I can I can send to um, people joining uh, joining this webinar is we haven't given up. Um, we know access is, is an issue. We know it's having an impact on patient care. I mean, the recommendation five is very clear. Uh, you know, um, progress has gone down the other way, really, uh, with dental care provision uh, and commissioning needs to improve to meet the needs of it. I am an optimist. I mean, I am an optimist. Uh, we know this is an issue. Uh, I'm sure I know uh, colleagues in NHS England know that, that it's an issue and um, it won't surprise you that we, you know, um, John and colleagues, we meet with uh, our commissioning colleagues um, on a regular basis, on a, on a monthly basis, and, and these things come up time and time again. But I am an, I am an optimist and I think the new financial year with delegated powers coming down to um, integrated care boards may give more flexibility of how things are commissioned locally. And from my perspective, this report highlights that, you know, um, things are going uh, in the wrong direction with with access. And, you know, these are the, these are the questions that we, we will be asking uh, our integrated care systems and say, well, this is what the data is showing, you know, what, how are you working together? How are you collaborating uh, amongst yourselves uh, to come up with something to deliver to the needs of the patient? Um, so it is it is on our agenda. It's, it's not going to go away. I think as we start visiting um, integrated care systems over the next 12 months, uh, we will we will continue to have a focus on oral health and I, I think that will encourage commissioners uh, to to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Um, I think just one uh, just one final um, point or, or question and topic that's in the chat is around um, the training. Um, so training for team members in care homes um, and competency assessments. And I think, you know, that that's right to say, you know, we can you know, there's training we can access, um, the, the things that uh, John has pointed people towards the, the Mouse Matters uh, report. Um, the care certificate um, doesn't have uh, oral health as a mandatory training requirement. Somebody's asked that question, you know, why is it not mandatory? Um, but it is something that we would expect care homes to uh, be supporting and providing the staff with because it's part of everybody's uh, care needs, the generalised care needs. So when we go in and look um, at inspection, you know, we are looking uh, for for um for care plans on oral health and and for you know what staff are being support, you know how staff are being supported to provide good oral health. So. I would encourage you to 
you know, to to uh, access what you can in that respect and, and do competency assessments uh, where you can and have the champions in the home like uh, Claudia uh, alluded to, because there are things you can do there that, you know, are, um, you know, are free, but you can promote within within the care, the care home. There's a lot of questions around domiciliary care. Um, this report and this sample of inspections that we did was in care homes. Um, it wasn't in domiciliary care settings, but I think it would be fair to say that the findings here and the and the recommendations and the, the outcomes, whilst they are linked to care homes, they, you know, they can very much be um, aligned and parts taken from this report and, and used and, and looked at within a domiciliary care setting uh, as well. I think that would be fair to say, uh, and John, I hope you agree with that comment. Um, and I'm not just going off on a, a tangent there <laughs> with that. OK, actually, John's just asking me if he can come back in about something. So, John, I'll, I'll, you come back in. <laughs> I did want to come back in about the finger of the mouth issue. I just want to uh, clear that one up because I've seen there's been a, a couple of comments about how difficult that is, how it might be invasive and how it might be. Um, and, and it also might be risky. Um, and, and I'd agree with those comments. It would. I think that the finger in the mouth, mouth issue was about actually just trying to um, move the cheek back to enable you to get a toothbrush in and things like that. So um, I just want to clear it up. I'm not advocating poking your fingers all over the place because that uh, that might be tricky. But what I would advocate uh, is it is getting it is getting help and support in actually how to help people with oral hygiene um, when they're struggling. They they don't want to let you open their mouth. There are techniques that can be used um, and there are people far more expert than me who can teach you those things, but there is help available. And just the bit that I said about domiciliary care um, services um, and say supported living settings, um, Although this, um, the inspections that we did in this report focuses on care homes, I think it would be fair to say, would you agree, John, that you know there's a lot in here that can be taken and applied to that setting as well? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, yeah. there are there are okay. millions of people cared for in their own homes, and oral health is is an issue and a difficulty for them to, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So I think um, as we're coming towards the end of the webinar. Um, if everyone's in agreement on the panel, I think we can, um, you know, we've probably covered the majority of themes within the question. So I hope everybody's found that helpful. Um, all that there's really left for me to to run through with you is information uh, about how you can stay up to date with the Commission and uh, what we've got going on. Um, it's not just about Smiling Matters. Um, everything that's on this slide is uh, things that you can link into. So it has our provider bulletin and blogs. Um, we've got a Twitter account, um, Connect and a digital platform. So th there's, there's conversation you can have. You can continue the conversation by the digital platform. But I would really encourage you if you're not already to get get yourself signed up to things like the provider bulletin we you know we really want to be proactive about our engagement with providers and with the public and um you know and and really have that two-way conversation uh with people so um and again we, we are going through quite a big transformation within the commission so you can keep yourselves up to date with that we you know we've got information on there about our new single assessment framework um and and our new way of regulating the ics assurance uh work and new powers that we've got on so um hopefully you'll find that useful i am told that um everybody who's attended today will get the, sh the slides shared with them and we'll get um this this slide will be in there so you can you can link up if you haven't um, scribbled away all of those um, website addresses already. Um, so just finally, I'd just like to say thank you ever so much to everybody on the panel today for their input. Um, I hope that people who have attended that you found that useful um, and I do hope you can find the time, if not already, to to have a look through the Smiling Matters report and take from that um, you know some of the findings and um, recommendations and see what you can apply within your own care settings um, and really special thank you to uh, Claudia and Donald I know you didn't get the get to see Donald on on in real person on screen but um, Claudia I know you spoke on behalf of your organization and I'm really grateful for that we're really grateful for that as a commission so um Thank you again to everyone for attending and to the panel and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.